please welcome this evening's guest moderator, IndieWire's Eric Cohn, and tonight's guest, Jay Duplass, Mark Kelly, and Steve Zissis. How's it going? And hello, everyone. So, Jay, you and your brother, Mark Duplass, have made uh, five feature films to date, including, uh, obviously, The Puffy Chair, your first film, and Jeff Who Lives at Home, which came out before this movie uh, that hit DVD last week. But it, this is actually the third feature that you guys directed. So could you demystify that timeline a little bit for us? Yeah, uh, we, we actually shot this film in uh, May or April or May of 2008. Um, it was, uh, you know, another small movie in the line of the Puffy Chair and Baghead movies that, that we made on digital video with our friends and family. This one we made in our hometown of New Orleans. Steve and I actually even went to high school together in that town. Um, and you know, we, it was a homemade movie that we, uh, we shot and then we were lucky enough when we came back to Los Angeles to edit it that um, we were greenlit by Fox Searchlight to make our first studio feature, Cyrus. Um, so we made that film and then back to back we were lucky enough to be greenlit for Jeff Who Lives at Home by Paramount. So we literally were on, you know, I guess it's a three, almost four year hiatus. Once we finished Jeff Who Lives at Home, we, we literally went right back and, and finished editing this movie and, and you know, released it. So it's, it's, it's a hometown movie for us. It's really special and close to our hearts. And um, it's, ex you know, it's exciting to be able to show it finally. And Steve and Mark, uh, th I'd like to ask you a little bit about the method of working with these guys because the, c the kind of legend that's, that's come out ever since, you know, Puffy Chair kind of came out of the Sundance Film Festival and became very popular and, you know, opened the doors for these guys to make studio films is that, you know, they, a lot of what they do seems effortless and yet at the same time it's very complicated. You know, th this idea of, of not using a script or, or writing a script and then throwing it out or shredding it, I'm not exactly sure. But maybe you can tell us more than, than Jay could... What's appealing to you about, about the way that these guys work? Well, it's just very absolutely freeing uh, f f from an actor's standpoint. Um, you know, they, th there is an absolute method to the madness, so to speak. It's not um, by accident that these great stories are told by these guys. They write wonderful scripts. And then they, they really, you know, set up every scene with a specific vision and um, we're just given, you know, a lot of freedom to take risks and explore different uh, ways to play a scene and and working with actors like Steve, it, it's just uh, phenomenal to put it all together. And Steve, of course, you were also the, the bumbling anti-hero of, of Baghead, another Duplass joint. So, uh, can, can you, I mean... What do you mean by bumbling? Well, you know, it's, it's all relative, I suppose. Maybe anti-hero isn't the same thing in a Duplass Brothers movie than it is in, in others. But, but for you, I mean, what is, uh, what, what is it about these guys that, that makes you really enjoy working with them? Well, um, wow, that was loud. <laughs> I was just going to say... Pipe down over there, huh? Am I really? Am I pipe? Okay, let me just... <laughs> um, I guess it's kind of like uh, walking a tightrope when you're acting with them. Um, but they make you feel really safe, so you know there's a net down there. So even if I fall, I'll, I'll be okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's thrilling as an actor to work that way because uh, you're in a scene and you're sort of um, helping write a little bit too at the same time that you're pushing the story forward and um, sometimes you're peppering, uh, peppering the scene with things that happened in your own life or things that are uh, very personal to you. So, um, and a lot of that takes place in this movie. So let's get personal for a second, uh -oh. Jay. You work with your brother. You've made a movie about brothers who, who are involved in a feud. When I watch something like this, I wonder, you know, have you ever thought about just making a documentary about this kind of experience, you know, instead of, you know, using the narrative format to, to translate that? Yeah, I mean, we, m my brother and I are obsessed with documentary. It is our primary influence for what we do. But, you know, because basically, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what we do are relationship, um, you know, conflict, we, we realized at a certain point there was no way it was going to happen in documentary form. But, you know, a lot of people also ask us, you know, is this reflective of my brothers and my relationship? Because, you know, it, it is 
it can be challenging to work with siblings, much less be in the same room with siblings. But, you know, we do make feature films together. You have to get along pretty well to do it. But this story was actually birthed out of something that was true, like like most of our movies are birthed out of, you know, relationships or dynamics that, that have been true or have, have occurred to us or people that we're close to. Um, but this one in particular, as outlandish as the story is, two brothers competing in their own personal 25 event Olympics, it's actually probably the most true uh, to, to, to form because my brother and I actually grew up down the street from two brothers who we were really good friends with who literally created a 25 event Olympics um, to uh, determine who is the better brother, not necessarily really the better athlete, just the better human being. Because um, <laughs> I think when you're 17, you know, sports are the sum total of like what you consider worthy in the world. So, but um, these two guys are actually here, and I would like to bring them up on stage if that's okay. I think that's okay. Is that, is okay? that okay with you guys? Um, Mark Solak and Anton Solak, my buddies from New Orleans, Louisiana. Hey. The true creators of the dodecapentathlon. <laughs> the actual pentathlon. Yes. And so before you guys say anything, we actually have a clip from the Blu-ray that uh, came out last week, the, a, a brief documentary that you guys actually did make about, about the inspiration. Yes, this scene is included on the DVD, and it's, it's a sort of a... Uh, a, a short documentary on the what we call the dodecapentathlon redux, which is um, in the film, you know, the, the two brothers um, actually come back together after being estranged for 20 years and reignite the actual dodecapentathlon competition. These guys did it in high school. The results actually were shrouded in controversy. Uh, the, the competition was never completed, but after we, um, we filmed the movie, we decided we needed to get these two guys back together and we needed to film their actual competition. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we have any of those events in this clip, but this, this clip definitely sets up um, their history with, the, with creating the event. So guys, has there ever been any talk of another pentathlon in the future? Um, well, there actually was one out in uh, early this year in, in the spring. Um, I won't disclose the results because, you know, I just don't want to do that. It's keep it close to the vest, right? And whatever they were, they were, you know, statistically insignificant anyway, right? So, um, but yeah, we, we did actually Spoke revisit like the, uh, the, uh, the Dodeca in, uh, I guess, April or something like that, uh, all, all 25 events. Um, whereas we only got through sort of like maybe six or seven the first time around, right? So this was a whatever, whatever. That is, um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was a not, not that anybody's counting, not <laughs> whatsoever. Well, it, it, it changes every time we, we have this conversation. You know, it's, it's three, it's five, it's ten. Each time you're winning by a wider and wider margin. Nine to one. And in any case. I kind of feel like I'm in the movie right now, actually. <laughs> So a lot of people have sibling rivalry stories, but not all of them have the opportunity to have them adapted for, for a feature. So what was your reaction when these guys came to you and said, we want to, you know, to do this thing? Jay had always, was always kind of amazed by the rivalry that we had. I mean, he knew of this, obviously, at the time it was going on. And, and I think, you know, he, he thought it was hilarious at that time. And, and I, I don't know, I feel like we, you had mentioned it before. I mean, as, you, as you, your career kind of started ramping up. And when he, when he brought it to me and said, you know, hey, I want to do this, I couldn't have been more excited about it. Um, it's probably, I don't know that it's worthy of, of making a film about it. I don't know if I'm worthy of making a film about it, but uh, it, it, uh, it came out really well. What did people uh, say to you guys, family members, coworkers, friends, what did they say when you told them that a movie was going to be made about something you created when you were teenagers? They asked, there's something to make a movie about you on. I mean, that, that, they, they're just, <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't register with them, you know? And the, the actors here and, the, and the, the real McCoy just met for the first time, in fact, backstage, which is an interesting sort of thing because sometimes, you know, you hear about biopics where the actor meets, you know, the subject or something like that. But here it seems like, you know, w w you, the distance actually allowed you to kind of invent the character from scratch in a way. Was that an intentional thing on your part, or did it just kind of happen that way? Uh, mostly, you know, we were using the concept of the dodecapentathlon and, and this idea to create distance between two brothers and this controversy. So it was really just uh, more than anything uh, 
you know, this lore of this crazy personal Olympics that these two guys created in order to um, beat the crap out of each other slash express how much they love each other at the same time. Um, that had always been in the soup for me and Mark, and that was really what was the importance of, of that event. You know, these the movie is actually, um, you know, these guys are both family guys. They actually both live in New Jersey. Uh, they've moved, you know, they're, they're friends and close. Um, but the way we set the film up is that one of them is sort of like a Vegas uh, single guy, and then we have the family guy, and they both sort of secret, secretly desire each other's lives and, you know, are miserable in their own way and thinking that the grass is greener. So, you know, we, we definitely took a lot of, you know, dramatic liberties to create, you know, uh, I guess a more... Um, um, you know, just a just a more dramatic arc, yeah. More In interesting, interesting than characters. And more interesting than these two guys. Interesting. We're <laughs> basically relative. the same person. <laughs> so, did the two of you guys talk about the kind of chemistry that you wanted to have on screen, or did it just sort of emerge organically? It definitely emerged organically and pretty instantly. So we were lucky that way, and that you know, the first from the first day on, it just kind of grew and grew, and I think we became just fond of each other as people by the end of it too and that played into some of the the you know love that's there between us that's yeah, we, lost that we're searching for we we had never met before and the very uh the very first scene we shot um I mean, we barely knew each other and it kind of added to the the tension in the air and yeah, you wouldn't we, even look at me it was i didn't even look very at me intimidating. In the eye, that whole scene well, why don't we take a look at some of that tension? We have a clip. Do you want to set it up really quickly? Yeah, the first clip we're going to show you is the pool clip, which is um, the, the, the estranged brother who lives in Vegas has, has just shown up um, uninvited to a, to a family gathering. And um, he's sort of uh, pushing his brother's buttons and trying to reignite the, the dodecapentathlon competition. Um, and he sort of sneaks up on him in the middle of the night and convinces him he he just wants to play a game of pool and uh being the athletic alcoholic that his brother is he can't really say no so just one game of pool did you guys play pool much when you were younger um older? yeah we did actually that was one of the the very few events that officially got completed was pool i think and um you, you might actually pull the upset in pool somehow uh first and second time but yeah, that, that, was, that was one of the official events. Well, call it what it is, it was an upset, right? I mean, I think you'd have to admit that. I That's a yes. So. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, so, so uh, when you guys were playing this game, I mean, was it, uh, you know, knowing what we know about their method being sort of, uh, you know, we, they write a script and then you kind of work your way through it, did you know who was going to come out on top when you were doing these different sort of competitions? Some of the events were definitely scripted for uh, ver various reasons. Um, and then the prideful ones that came into play to kind of fester our competitive angst towards one another. We chose our high school sports that were dear to us. Yeah, I had, was, we had private conversations. Yeah. with they, they, one, Each of them would pull us aside at a certain point and say, listen, um, I played baseball in high school, varsity baseball. Um, I don't know what, if that means anything to you, but I need to win this. <laughs> and so we would give them each. And, you know, at the same time, we really, it was important for us to show. I mean, honestly, in casting these two guys, you know, the really important things were obviously great actors and phenomenal human beings that we wanted to be around and felt like we could create art with. But beyond that, it really was about having two guys who were very athletic and could carry that and show that we didn't want it to be a joke because you know really you know the seed of the ideas is you know so many people that we've grown up with who are just obsessed with sports i mean then the, the the percentage of men in america who watch three hours of sports center every night is just out of control you know there are a lot of people who do this so it was important to us that these guys could really play ball and we also wanted them to be out of shape so that it would, you would have that great contra contrast of them. Like, they, they didn't look great, but then when they would, like, dribble a ball and come up and shoot, it looked really, really good. And that you, you would feel that potential energy in there. And, and so, you know, working to these guys' strengths was, was a big deal. And, you know, they, both of them had, you know, at least 
10, 15 sports that they, we had to dumb down some of it, honestly, because they were both really, you know, great high school athletes. So why don't we take a look at another clip that's uh, something that might remind us that it's not just a sports movie. There's a little bit more going on. Yeah, there. I guess um, sort of the subplot of, it's not, I don't even know where the plotting fits in this, but, you know, essentially the brothers are um, creating this, they're, they're reigniting their competition over the course of a family weekend, and they're sort of ruining the family vibe of the whole thing because they're staying up all night. They're co-opting certain family events, such as like a, family laser tag show to, you know, basically uh, shoot each other up. Um, and, and so um, at a certain point, they realize that they have to, they're going to have to work together in order to better destroy each other throughout the competition. And uh, once they decide this in a private conference in the restroom, they come out, and this is their presentation to their family of, uh, of how they're going to swindle the rest of the uh, 25 events. Let's take a look. That is quite a line. You just come up with that one, or was that uh... It's sort of, yeah, spilled out of me. Very soulful. Yeah. And, yeah, <laughs> and we claim it as our own brilliant writing. It's a great system. It's been working out for us for about six years now. We plan to continue <laughs> it. Well, why don't you talk about that a little bit more? I mean, so the idea is you've always done it this way. You write the screenplay, and then you throw it out. Where's the sense in that? Explain yourself. <laughs> Explain myself. And how do you um, get movie stars to do it? How do we get movie stars to throw away scripts that they sign on that, yeah, that inspires them to actually come onto set? It's actually really hard to uh, get. It, it can be difficult to get um, actors to sort of um, live in chaos with us because it's interesting because our movies, I think they play fun, but uh, they. It's not particularly fun to be on one of our sets because when you're an actor and when you're a writer director, you are sitting in chaos and you are saying that the gods are in charge as opposed to you or you know we're basically just trying to create an environment where lightning can strike and the best version of what we intended can happen and it's really it, it has to do with a lot of things. One, we tried to be the Cohen brothers in our early 20s. We failed miserably. They're still our favorite filmmakers, but what we do is so different and we just were not able to make anything great in a controlled fashion, and, and we, we were taking acting classes, and it was all about the loss of control, and we started getting really inspired by that and just seeing these incredible interactions that were happening in front of us. So that's our sort of MO on set, is to create an open environment, to shoot it like a documentary so that these guys have their moments on their own. We're not, we're not really... Um, interfering with them along the way. We're not controlling it. We're just capturing it as documentary filmmakers. Of course, in between takes, we're like guiding them and, and like giving them ideas. But um, I guess it really just comes down to this is, this is what we feel like we're good at and what we have to offer. It's also what we love the most. And you know, we're, we're overly obsessed with uh, performance, with truthful performances. And we're very obsessed with things just feeling real and feeling genuine and stories unfolding in ways that feel genuine to us and and um i guess in retrospect when you shoot it in a documentary way and you foster interactions like this uh, it gives it sort of maybe an extra level of reality because we're not really dealing in like high-end tragedy or like the worst thing that happens in any of our movies is like someone's feelings get hurt really really bad you nobody know di nobody dies nobody dies nobody gets you know it's it's very um you know it's small stakes, but it's the stakes that we experience in our own lives and, and feel enormous to us on a daily basis. So I think our filmmaking process is all about trying to achieve that feeling of immediacy, the feeling that you would have if you thought like your girlfriend was leaving you, you know, just like the little the level of panic and life crushing blow that that would deal to, you know. And yet at the same time, you make comedies, so... I don't know why it's funny. I'm just glad that people laugh. I really, I mean, I know we have a sense about it, but I, it's very hard to describe why it happened or, or, you know, the only way I can describe it is that, you know, we were making bad movies and then one day we made this short film about a guy trying to perfect the personal greeting of his answering machine, failed, had a breakdown. It's something that had happened to me two weeks before and we took it to Sundance and everybody laughed enormously and then some people were like crying and then they were upset with each other for having how dare you laugh at such an intimate you know and then the other one was like that's the f funniest thing I've ever seen and uh, you know 
that was a three dollar short film that we got us an agent and a lawyer and written up in variety and did more for us than everything before and so we just kind of we were just lucky enough to to luck into that to be dumb enough to keep making movies until something good happened and I mean we do love doing it the way that we do so let's take a look at one final clip and I think it's a good illustration of this you know showing like a real tension and at the same time it is genuinely funny yeah this is sort of a moment where you know the competition actually breaks out and um you know there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of um family dynamic there's a lot of relationship dynamic in this movie and 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 people i mean it's weird i saw it last night for the first time in a while i think it's really about people finding the balance between being who they are and being who they are in a relationship and i guess this is one of the moments where the guys really bust out into being who they are or at least who they think they are so punchline ever all right so let's go back to the solex brothers for a second True to life, the vomiting, which one? <laughs> I, I didn't think we got it to any long distance running back in, uh, in 1990, but, uh, but it was the mostly, mostly parlor games for the first 10, I see. you know. We didn't want to stress ourselves out too much. So the, the bodily fluids were a little more contained. Not yet, yeah. <laughs> so I want to I leave a little bit of time for questions at the end, but very quickly, uh, you were talking more about how, you know, you find this balance between comedy and drama, and I think, you know, it's interesting because, you know, generally the way that things work in, in Hollywood, they need to know what kind of a genre it is so they can sell it that way. And that's something that you guys have been able to kind of work around in different sorts of ways. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing next and you know how you're able to sort of capitalize on the reputation you guys have gathered just in the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the things that we've done in Hollywood and are, and are you know continuing to do are really just based on people who just love what we do and 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 want to do it further because we've definitely uh entered into a lot of you know conversations with people who want to take what we do and just jack up the comedy or whatever it is that we do and um it's been excruciatingly painful and it was especially in our early 30s to say no to a lot of that stuff just because um we had made it that long without earning any money and you know being comfortable in our lives so we did we did a lot of saying no in Hollywood and, and now we're lucky enough to have some people who say yes to what we want to do and and you know so right now we're, we are writing a lot of things we're writing things for ourselves but we're also um, we're writing something for Scott Rudin which is um, a remake of the film um, same time next year which is a you know it's it's a it's an old school 70s relationship movie um, between you know about two people who keep coming back together again and, and you know have this relationship over time and it's um in a weird way it, it it's i feel like there were a lot of films in the 70s that are dramatic at the core but were really funny at the same time and and i i feel like that's what we're doing it it seems funny to me that that that's such a novel thing right now and people are talking about how we invented this brand i don't know if it really you know i mean in the late 70s there were so many films that were 85 to 90 minutes long that were straight up relationship movies that were also really really funny um i don't think we're in the same wheelhouse as it but like annie hall is is a is a movie that is you know what is it 90 minutes and it's it's a drama first and it's a comedy second and it you know um captured everybody i don't know it just doesn't seem that common right now so well, you got some time before you have to make your annie hall. thank you i appreciate that <laughs> so let's do some questions we have some anybody in the audience we got a microphone going around just raise your hand i'll come on over right here in the second row uh, guys, uh, question for Jay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the writing process when you and your brother Mark were writing it? Did you consult with Anton and Mark? And how did you balance like staying true to the idea but then taking dramatic license, I guess, with it? Um, we just talked to them, and uh, they sent us an Excel spreadsheet of some of the events that uh, randomly one of them had had on his computer. Um, no big deal, not that he was uh, dig living in the past. Um, <laughs> But that was really it. It was, I mean, like Mark had said, Mark and I were really close. We were the same year in high school. And, um, you know, my brother and I have always been uh, students of the human beings and the weird stuff that they do. And I think, you know, Mark can attest, even before I knew I was a filmmaker, I was obsessed with this idea and the fact that they did this and would question him greatly about the details of, you know, the Papa Shot competition, the Papa Shot basketball competition. And, 
you know, it, it, was, it was just part of what I've always been obsessed with. So we didn't, you know, once we got their permission, it's really hard to write a decent script, in my opinion. Uh, so it, we just kind of let loose and just created whatever story that we thought would, 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 move, would move best. We have another question right here in the third row. It's not related to movie. My, my nephew is into uh, filming. He wants to get a good camera. Um, and I'm trying to encourage him to do this. And I just, you know, at home, when it's snowing out, we just play around on the computer, make skits. How did you guys start when you first started? Same way. Same just, way? It's just Wait, making and, little and I, things. Sorry. Um, you know, I honestly feel like uh, the best thing that you can do, and honestly, we tell this to, you know, filmmakers who are coming out of graduate film school, the way that the world is right now, it's very, very cheap to buy a camera and to make a movie. Um, you, you don't really need much. Um, almost every computer has editing software, and I think you can use whatever you have, and I think you can use whatever camera you have. And, I, you know, I'm sure Eric can speak to this, but in our experience, um, when we finally made something that was decent, and that took me till I was 29 years old, and that was that answering machine movie. Um, that movie was shot on my parents' home video camera. We spent $3 on it, that is no joke. It was a tape that we bought at 7-Eleven down the street from our house, and that movie did more for us than all of the films we made in film school and all of the multi-thousand dollar movies that we made you know, up until that point. I know a few thousand dollars is not a lot for some people, but Mark and I came from just regular dudes growing up in New Orleans. That was devastating to us to have, you know, a $3,000 film not do something. So you don't, it's not about money, and, and it's really just about ideas. I would say it's about ideas, and I would say it's about performance. That Those are the two things that uh, you can't do without, but those are the really, those are free things, and and... Honestly, I've edited all my movies except for our studio films on laptops. Uh, even in 2005, in 2004, I edited um, my first feature film called The Puffy Chair on, on, a, on a laptop. It was an Apple laptop, yeah. He'll be here afterwards. We can get into yeah. the tech specifics. We had, we, had, we had to leave room for him. We have another question all the way to your right. I'm bringing the mic on over. Hi, so I have two brothers. We never did anything as extreme as this. Um, maybe playing like blind man's bluff in a dark basement and running blindfolded at each other was really as extreme as we got. Um, but I was That's wondering- That's pretty good. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it, he, my, you know, we stopped after my head, brother had to get stitches, rushed to the, you know, the emergency room, it was bad. Um, but I was wondering if any of you guys have sisters or if you felt how a female presence would be incorporated into something such as this if it would kind of come out in the same way for a brother-sister type situation? I think out of all of us, we all have brothers, and only Steve has the one sister. You want to speak to that, Steve? I don't know. I had an older brother. He was seven years older than me, and he would throw pine cones at my head. <laughs> um... <laughs> And he also um, took a crap in the bathtub when we were little. When you um, were in the tub with him. When that's, I was in the tub with him. That's important. Um, I retaliated. I urinated in a, a margarine container <laughs> and then threw it on him when he was showering. <laughs> um, but then I realized that wasn't a good retaliation because he was showering. So I threw the urine on him, and then he just, just, just cleaned up in the shower. <laughs> So I really should have thrown the urine on him somewhere else, like after the shower. Yeah, like <laughs> at the dinner table. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I have a younger sister as well, um, and we would, and she was kind of tomboyish because I would play things with her. But I don't know. I don't know how that. How I don't know how this could work with a sister at the same time. Sounds like we need a sequel. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? We have, yeah, we can take one more. See right here in the second row. Uh, Jay, you spoke a lot about um, you know, using a documentary style with a particular a lot of your earlier work. Can you kind of explain more what that means exactly? And, and have you felt a need to become more structured 
as you, you know, with Cyrus, you know, John C. Riley's done a lot of movies. Did you have to kind of, or at least did you feel pressure, whether or not you actually succumbed to it, but did you feel pressure to, you know, become more structured and, and traditional in, in, in the style you shot things? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I definitely, uh, well, well, speaking to the style of it, I, the quickest way I think I can describe it is that almost every filmmaking process is about a giant machine or apparatus of filmmaking and then the actors are brought to it and there are marks and they have to walk up to the marks and they have to like fit into this giant machine that is created and I think our process is the flip-flop of that we get everyone is offset they're hiding even on big studio films they're in another room watching monitors the only people on set are myself who is shooting maybe another camera operator and a boom guy um, and these guys you know literally do the entire scene and we film it as a documentary film crew in the sense that they come first, they do whatever they want, they go wherever they want, and I bring the filmmaking apparatus to them. And it, it, it's, a, I mean, it's an enormous change. It sounds like just, you know, diction right now or whatever, but it's an enormous change being on set. Um, in terms of the pressure of shooting in Hollywood and, and shooting with, you know, John C. Riley and, and big actors, um, uh, there are enormous pressures. They are happening every day. Um, the it is people think that the point at which you might sell out is is a is a very um, big decision that you might make. But I think the reality is is, is in under, under the pressure of those sets, um, you're you're asked a question every minute in a day, and at every minute, the easiest decision is what makes everyone happy and doesn't make the better movie. And it literally is that way all times. Everyone is constantly coming up to you and saying, can we move on, can we move on? And to say no, we haven't gotten the magic thing yet. People start looking at you like, yeah, the magic thing? Um, I gave you $10 million, dude. Um, <laughs> so it, it's that, that experience is, so, is very, very overwhelming, but that's where it's actually really nice to have my brother with me, and I think it helps us turn inward and have strength around what, wait, what did just happen? Is that good? That was good, right? Like, I, I was enjoying that. Was that just because I'm in a weird place, or did I really enjoy that? Um, in terms of the actors, we literally do not hire anyone who doesn't love our movies prior to. John C. Riley was a huge fan of Puffy Chair. He expressed that, and we wrote Cyrus for him because of that. I mean, it was literally... We had always loved him, and just having him talk to us and tell us that he loved the movie inspired us to write something for him. We had always wanted to see him in a lead role. And we, we, we will never use anybody who doesn't love what we do already because what we do is already so unconventional that we don't want to have to headlock anybody into making a movie with us. Making movies is hard enough as it is, so we really just... Everyone, not only who is in the movie, but who works on the movie has to like our stuff, and we can tell. Uh, and, you know, or they have to at least appreciate it and believe in it and, and want to try and create this new thing. And, and that goes all the way down to, like, you know, um, you know PAs and, and grips and stuff like that. So we have to have that feeling on set. So if you want to check out some of that Duplass Brothers magic, you can watch this whole movie on Blu-ray. It's out now. I'm not being paid to say that. I really think you should check it out. It's, it's, it's an awesome movie. It's really funny, and, and it's kind of like classic for what these guys do. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all.